I'd like to begin by thanking our co-presenting sponsors, the Conte Center at Harvard and Beyond Conflict. Tonight's program is also sponsored by Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and the Lowell Institute. We deeply appreciate the contributions of these organizations that have made this program possible. And we are really happy tonight that a whole posse of people from one of our sponsors, our dear sponsor from Harvard Pilgrim, are here tonight. So we really thank all of you for your support and welcome. <clears throat> We've all heard Mahatma Gandhi's instruction, be the change you want to see in the world. At the museum this winter and spring, we've embarked on a journey to investigate how to affect that change. In the first program of the On Being, series, On Being Human series, we learned about healthy brain development and the brain's potential for plasticity. In the second program, we learned that stress, depression, or mental illness cause physiological as well as chemical changes in the brain. Tonight, we will explore the science of consciously changing our brains and the power each of us have to influence humanity in positive ways. Our first speaker, Betsy Levy Pallack, will tell us about her research on generating positive peer pressure for constructive societal change. Then, Richard Davidson will guide us into the realm of neuroscience and give us tools to actually change ourselves. We follow that with a conversation between our two guests, and then finally we'll take questions from the audience. Please join me in welcoming Betsy Levy Pollack. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I grew up not far from here and uh, came to the Museum of Science as a little girl with my parents, so it makes it even more of an honor. And uh, also my parents got to come tonight, so it's, it's a lot of fun to be here. Um, I want to talk to you tonight. Um, Dr. Davidson is going to tell you more about how to change brains and more about the physiology of brains. Um, I'm going to talk to you more about how our minds work in terms of collecting all of the social information that's out there and understanding what are the social norms of our communities, of our schools. Um, and the reason I'm interested in social norms is because they're powerful guides for our behavior. And what we're doing in my research lab is trying to understand large-scale patterns of behavior like conflict, so uh, patterns that we want to reduce, or cooperation, tolerance, kindness patterns that we want to uh, promote and reinforce. And uh, so I wanted to just take a moment to um, acknowledge uh, all of the people who are working on this with me. As you know, science is a, is a team effort. Um, so uh, the, some of the things that we're doing at, um, at Princeton, um, among them, is studying conflict in schools. And so when you think about conflict in schools, what's the first word that comes to mind? And you can just shout it right out. Bullying, yes, thank you. <laughs> so bullying, the technical and now legal definition of bullying is one-on-one um, -on -one conflict um, that often happens in an unequal power dynamic um, and is repeated many times uh, over the course of the, the school semester. And so we're really concerned about that, um, but we're also concerned about lots of other types of conflict behavior, um, things like mutual victimization, one-on-one, -on -one, or even um, when your, your friends are joining you to, to victimize another student, things like sexual harassment that go on in our schools. So all of the many, many ways, in short, uh, when I use the, way, the word conflict, I'm referring to all of the ways in which students can make each other feel unwelcome um, and unhappy at school. Um, we're in what journalist Emily Bazelon has called the second wave of awareness about bullying and conflict in our schools. And that's thanks to our students using uh, more and more social media and basically bringing these behaviors into the view of adults where they were hidden before in bathrooms and in hallways. So it's not necessarily an increase in these kinds of behavior, but we're more aware of it than before. And this awareness has given us the opportunity um, to start rethinking um, some of our policies um, and programs at schools about how can we make our schools a better place? How can we actually change the whole climate of, of a school? And in order to do this, we have to start thinking about, well, what are the causes of conflict in the first place? Now, when people start talking on, by people I mean policymakers, teachers, ed, you know, all these um, different folks working on this problem, researchers like myself, um, when we talk about the, the causes of conflict in school, people generally fall within uh, one of two camps. 
I'd say the first camp focuses on the character of our kids, saying that if students are getting involved in these kinds of conflicts and victimizing one another, um, it's usually due to the way they were taught or raised, and we need to teach them empathy. Uh, we need to teach them better ways to interact with one another in order to uh, start to reduce this conflict. The other camp would point to more societal uh, ideas and say, well, no, it's actually messages that they're getting from the media. It's uh, messages that they're getting in the schools. Um, and so in order to change this problem, we need to do everything we can. We need to change our laws. We need to train the teachers. Uh, we even need to you know, redo the, the physical structures of our schools, okay? So lots of different um, interventions. So what do we make of these explanations? Um, well, one thing I would say is that psychology, and I'm a trained psychologist, psychology would encourage us not to only look at the character of our kids. Um, and in fact, um, in a lot of research, it shows that um, kids don't enjoy the conflict. Most, most kids do not enjoy the conflict, aren't getting something out of it. Um, they're made very uncomfortable when they see someone, an another peer being victimized. But they don't intervene mostly because they perceive that they'll be disliked or punished by their peers if they did intervene. So they have this social expectation that they shouldn't get involved. And in fact, sadly, their, their expectations are often borne out. So in other studies, when we actually ask students to judge um, whether they'd like to be friends with a so-called active bystander who they've just seen intervene um, in a conflict situation, students actually like the active bystander less than a student who didn't get involved in it. Okay, so they're, they're expecting things to happen, and, and in fact, they're often right. So if we turn to all of the other kinds of explanations, um, there's also a reason to not solely rely on uh, the camp that says it's in our culture. And I'd say that's for two reasons. One, that's kind of a discouraging explanation. And two, it often points to adults as a solution. So why is it discouraging? Well, we think of culture as something that changes very slowly, right? So it requires wholesale change. We need to, again, change our laws, our teachers, train everybody we can. Um, we need to change the media. And then second and related, the people who are in charge of all of those factors are adults, right? So it really disempowers students uh, from being part of the solution. Uh, we know that they're part of the problem, but what, what would it look like if they were actually part of the solution of changing the, the climate of their school in terms of uh, making it a better place to be, a, a more tolerant place to be? So in my, um, in my lab, we've been working on that third uh, option, as we would think of it. Um, it's somewhere between uh, the two camps that I just told you about. And what we like to do is we try to think about, well, how are students setting social expectations? So I already, I already previewed for you that students have this expectation that they'll be punished if they try to reduce conflict in their schools. Where do, they, where do these come from? Okay, so certainly, of course, they come from our society, but we think that they also come from the peers all around them, okay? So we specialize in my lab in understanding how the mind takes in all of the, the social behavior around us and decides what is, on average, the expectations of me in this group of people, okay? So, in other words, every time a student observes another student post a mean comment on a website, they observe that, well, this kind of behavior is, is common. And every time they observe other students not reporting someone when um, they've abused another uh, student to a teacher or something like that, they learn, ah, that's undesirable to do that, right? Repeated interactions over time, our minds are paying attention and we're learning, actually, this is the social norm of this environment, of my school environment. These kinds of behaviors are common, these kinds of behaviors are desirable. And it's those perceptions, we would argue, that drive much of this repeated behavior over time. Not necessarily because everybody's enjoying it or because no one has empathy, but because they're actually being very adept social animals. Um, and in fact, that's how we all work. This isn't something that's specific to adolescents. But nonetheless, in this project, we're going to focus on adolescents and see, well, can we change this? Um, one thing I should tell you is that adolescents are not conforming to these, these social norms because they're lemmings, because they're just trying to be like everybody else. One reason that we know humans are really motivated to, to follow social norms is because we just don't want to deviate too far from them. So we still want to be ourselves. Um, but, but it's not that we all want to be alike one another. Um, so another thing that we have been investigating is whether we need to change everybody in order to change a perceived social norm. And in fact, we had this intuition when we, when we started this research based on um, you know, standing on the shoulders of others who have done this kind of research in the past, that in fact, some people in the social network of a school would have more influence 
over these, these perceived norms, that their behavior, in other words, our minds would weight their behavior more heavily than others when we're trying to figure out what's normal here, what's desirable here, okay? So we're trying to find those individuals. This is the social network of a school, of a high school. All of the circles are students. Some of them are gray and some of them are yellow. The ones who we colored in yellow, uh, and I should say also the, the lines in between them, are uh, their relationships. So we asked these students all in a survey, who did you spend time with, who did you want to spend time with in the last few weeks, um, either face-to-face -face or online. And then we were able to draw this map based on their responses. Okay? This is everybody in the school. The ones who are colored in yellow are people who we call social reference. These are the people who we think in this school have um, an over, overweighted influence when it comes to the way that other students perceive the social norms of the school when it comes to conflict and even other things as well. Um, social reference, uh, they can come in a, in a variety of uh, social network configurations, but I'm zooming in on the social network here to show you what they would look like if you zoomed into that map that I just showed you. Um, one type of social referent, we call them the widely known. Um, as you can see, they have a lot of friends, so many, in fact, that not all of the friends know one another. So they have a status as someone who knows a lot of people, and they're someone to be watched in the school. Note that we didn't call them popular, and if you think back to your own high school days, all the people who were widely known weren't exactly popular, right? So we stay away from that term. Uh, so these are the widely knowns. The other people who we uh, look for in our social network, and we find them just purely mathematically, right, so we're not asking people to nominate others, um, is the click leader. And we think that these people are important because they're the leaders of small subgroups within the network. And these subgroups are people who you need to reach out to if you want entire network change, if you want this sort of climate level change, um, because they often define their identities against the identity of the mainstream. Okay? So we try to reach out to them as well. So let me tell you about a study we did. We went into a high school. We identified using the social network mapping that I showed you, all of the widely knowns and all of the click leaders at the school. And then what we did was we actually used experimental methods and we randomly assigned one portion of them to participate in basically a campaign against conflict at the school. We tried to convince them to come up and speak in front of their school at a school assembly and these are used very frequently in schools um, to combat bullying and, and conflict. Um, but they were chosen explicitly by us to come up um, and talk about their experiences and just to be very salient in everybody's eyes I am against conflict at this school. And we predicted that their behavior, the way everyone else's minds were working in the school, if you were connected to those people, uh, and if you saw their faces on posters that they made throughout the rest of the year, you would be associating their identity with less conflict. And your mind would start to tell you, well, you know, maybe those behaviors aren't as normal at this school or desirable. So let me tell you a little bit about the results we found. Uh, we found them through surveys. Uh, we, both, we asked all the students at the school whether many students thought that it was normal to start drama. And I should tell you, drama means conflict at this school. Um, <laughs> never, never use the word bullying with adolescents above a certain age. Uh, we learned that very quickly. Um, so we asked them about norms. And this is how a psychologist would ask about norms. We would say, how many people, for example, how many people in this room are talking right now? Well, just one, so it's not very normative to talk, right? So, so this is how many, um, and this is the result that we found that people were less likely to say that student thought it was nor students thought it was normal to start drama, or more people were likely people were more likely to say that it was okay to ignore rumors. Okay, and that was based on the number of connections you had to these social reference. The same thing happened with students' behavior. So as we see these norms spreading out from the reference who were involved in the program, likewise we see less conflict behavior um, spreading out. So um, they were less likely to be disciplined for peer conflicts in this study, and that was according to school records, so how many people were dragged into the office, basically. Um, and then we also got teachers to tell us, uh, to nominate students, who was um, contributing to a negative environment, who's defending other students from harassment, and you were more likely, for example, to be nominated by a teacher as someone who defends others from harassment um, if you had more connections to these social reference. So basically, you see it spreading across the network. Okay. So now what I want to tell you about is the next study that we did, because we thought, okay, these are great results. We see norms spreading and behavior spreading alongside of them. So this seems to be like a great intervention. The next thing that we did was we said, well, what if we took this to a number of schools? So what you're seeing now is the other 56 schools. I promised in my title that I was going to talk about 57, so that was one. 
here are the rest. Here are 56 schools that we worked in last year. And we did a different kind of experiment now with all of these different schools. You can see all of their amazing different configurations. Um, and in these, I should mention, the uh, students are all colored in red, and the social reference, who we found again, are colored in blue. What we did here was we divided them in half, and we said in 28, we will do a social, uh, a social network anti-conflict intervention. And the other half will just measure conflict behavior. We'll leave them alone. Because what we want to do, ultimately, is to be able to say, this intervention changed the entire network. And the only way to do that scientifically was to compare networks, not to compare students anymore. So what we did this time was we invited a representative group of students from every school. So not just the social reference, but also just other students. Um, and the number of social reference varied from school to school. So some of them had a lot of social reference. Some of them had you know, few. Um, and they did a campaign across the entire th school year. And our interest now was not just do we see norms spreading, do we see um, less conflict spreading across the network, but is there actually less conflict overall at the school if we change the climate? Okay. So what we did this year is um, something that I'd actually like to emphasize for these kinds of uh, programs is that um, the, the program really came from the students. So we didn't give them a manual and say, these are the things that you need to change at your school. We went to them because we wanted to know what are the problems that you see going on at your school. We know that they're going to change from school to school. Each school is different. Um, and we knew that that would also make them more authentic to their peers. Um, basically, that um, other students at the school wouldn't perceive them as saying something that uh, the teacher had told them to say. But, based, but it would be based on their own opinions about what they wanted to change at the school. And these were the kinds of things that the students in all of the um, schools where we did this program, these are the kinds of things that they would say. We helped the students then to basically do a grassroots campaign at their school, um, using techniques, postering the walls, signing their names to these uh, hashtags that they made, um, going online and starting a campaign there, taking their message online, um, and even spreading wristbands across the school. So they uh, had a, a lot of wristbands made with slogans that they had come up with. Okay? And so basically, again, the idea is make these students really salient to others so that they start to process wait, what's normal at my school? What's desirable? Maybe it's not uh, you know, rumor mongering and gossip or racial slurs or things like this that um, you know, we heard about going on at all of these schools. OK, what you're looking at now, although they look like little cat paw prints all over the, the slides, are actually heat maps, uh, something that we call heat maps, of all 56 school networks. These are networks. Let me zoom in. OK. On the left-hand side are what we call the control schools, schools where we didn't work and do this intervention. On the right-hand side are the treatment schools where we did this anti-conflict intervention. As the, as the color gets lighter and brighter, that means less con uh, conflict. Okay? So the color is actually going along with the data. And what you can see is that there's overall network change in terms of the amount of conflict that you're seeing in the treatment schools compared to the control schools. Okay? So these students were effective. The other thing that I want to show you now, um, and here's my nerdy graph, is um, we found that, the, in fact, the, the, stu the schools where there were more social reference working on this problem were more effective. Okay? So on the top here, this is the average number of times students at the control schools were pulled into the office and, and disciplined for harassing another peer. Okay? So on average, 0.2 events per student in, in all of the control schools. What you can see is that in the treatment schools, um, there's, there's a difference, it's lower, but on the bottom line here, this says proportion of social reference in the group. So as the number of social reference go up, the difference grows stronger, okay? So what I really like about this study is that it's giving us a message about how to spread these kinds of behaviors, these kinds of more tolerant and kind behaviors um, throughout our, our social networks, throughout our communities, um, in a way that doesn't require this kind of wholesale change, right? It starts from a few people and generalizes out. And in part, I would submit because of the way our minds work, because of the way we see others' behavior, and we take that in to understand what are the social standards for my own behavior. Um, I think another positive message about this is that this study at least shows that you don't just need to use this elite force of social reference. Lots of other people uh, joined in. And uh, while the social reference helped make the group more effective, you still see this difference. So I think that's an important message for collective action. 
Um, so I'd like to end there, and, um, and now I think that we can go on to a sort of more neural level and angle on, on this kind of brain and behavior change with uh, Dr. Dr. Davidson. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Great to be here, and uh, uh, although I didn't grow up in Boston, I did go to school here, and I did spend time at the museum when I was in school, and it's really wonderful to be back. I haven't been back in a long time. And it was great to hear Betsy's talk. I um, must confess, I didn't know much about her work before this event, and this event has given me the opportunity to learn more about it, and I love what she's doing, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation about it and exploring areas of uh, potential um, convergence in, in the work that I'll discuss and the work that Betsy so beautifully presented. Uh, so the title of my talk, the first part, is Well-Being is a Skill. We don't normally think about well-being and other related constructs like happiness as skills, but one of the uh, essential messages of this talk is that this is where the data is leading us. This is where science is suggesting how we land. Uh, and the invitation that I'd like to offer this evening to each of you is that if we actually practice the um, constituents of well-being, we can actually enhance uh, these qualities. Uh, it, well-being is fundamentally no different than learning to play a violin or learning to play chess. If you practice at it, you'll get better. Uh, and when you practice at it, it turns out it changes your mind and your body in interesting ways. So um, let me, before I launch into this, just give you a little uh, bit of autobiographical background. I'm a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training, and I had the great fortune very early in my career of being around a number of people who were the kind of people I really wanted to spend time around. They were very warm-hearted. They are the kind of people that were infectious uh, to be around. And they weren't my professors in graduate school, for the most part. They were folks that I was lucky enough to meet on the outside. And one of the things I learned about them is that they all had an interest in and a practice of meditation, and uh, that this was something that they considered very important for uh, their well-being. And I, very early on in my graduate career, decided that I really wanted to learn more about this and do this. And I went off to India for the first time in the mid-1970s after my second year of graduate school to learn more about this. And I came back with a very fervent aspiration to do research in this area and to uh, embrace uh, some of these practices in mainstream science as a way for um, an opportunity for Western psychology to, uh, uh, to learn to gain some insights from these traditions from the East. But I was very quickly disabused of this idea by uh, those around me, and they told me in no uncertain terms that if, Richie, if you want a successful career in science, this is not a very good way for you to begin. Uh, and I was a very dutiful student and began to pursue other questions, which turned out to be the umbrella under which all of this is really organized, which is research on emotion in the brain, because one of the key targets of these contemplative practices is transforming emotion. Uh, in ways to promote well-being. So uh, my life, both my personal life and my professional life, in many ways were orthogonally rotated at a critical meeting I had in the fall of 1992. Uh, and that meeting was a meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama heard about my interest in this area and about the work I was doing, and he invited me to meet with him in his residence in India and he was interested in exploring the possibility of using the tools of modern science to investigate what's going on in the minds and brains of individuals who spent years 
training their mind in these interesting ways. And he challenged me and he said, look, you're using tools of modern neuroscience to study depression and sadness and anxiety. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And there really wasn't a good answer for it other than it was hard. Um, but uh, you know, it was hard when we first began to study fear and anxiety. And I made a commitment to the Dalai Lama on that day in 1992 that I was going to come out of the closet with my interests in this area because up until that point, I think it's fair to say that most of my colleagues in professional science really didn't know that I was a meditator. I didn't advertise it. Uh, the culture was a very different culture than we have today. Uh, and uh, uh, I made that commitment to the Dalai Lama, and since then, the journey has just unfolded, and it's really been amazing to see how rapidly things are changing. And this event is uh, just one of many uh, as a testament to this kind of work going much more mainstream. Now, uh, there have been some important... Um, some important milestones or changes in modern science that have allowed this work to go forward. And I'd like to just name a few of them. Uh, I'll, I won't spend too much time on them because we don't have too, that much time. But one is neuroplasticity, the simple idea that the brain changes in response to experience and in response to training. And this is probably the most important contribution of modern neuroscience in the last 15 years. It is the contributions pertaining to understanding the many different mechanisms of neuroplasticity. The second theme is a theme that is similar to neuroplasticity in the realm of genomics, and that is epigenetics, the idea that genes are regulated, and we can think of many of our genes having little volume controls, and they go from low to high, and depending upon our experience and our training, those, um, uh, vo that volume control can be turned up or turned down. Uh, and we actually just published the first evidence just a few months ago that shows that just one day of intensive meditation practice in the laboratory among long-term practitioners can induce a measurable change in gene expression. Uh, so through pure mental activity, we can actually see a systematic change in gene expression that can be measured and that seems um, quite relevant uh, for certain aspects of health. The third theme is this notion of the, uh, massive bi-directional connections between the brain and the body. And we're beginning to understand how stuff that comes in from, in, in, in from the world, psychosocial uh, events, get transduced by the brain and in turn affect the body. Our minds and our, uh, and our brains are embodied. And the changes in circuitry in the brain have influence on the body uh, that is consequential for health. And likewise, changes in the body can feed back to the mind and the brain and also influence activity there. Uh, and uh, this is a whole extremely uh, important and exciting area, which I'm really not going to touch on this evening because we don't have time. But this is the work that uh, is beginning to show that happier people are actually healthier. And it's beginning to, to uh, interrogate the mechanisms that uh, are responsible for that association. The last theme is a theme that's probably the most controversial of these four, and um, I'll show you one little tidbit about this theme. And this is a theme that I call innate basic goodness. And what I mean by this is that we are born with a bias toward goodness. Doesn't mean that we don't have constituents of negative stuff in us. But if we, if, we are, if we have the opportunity to express a preference, we'll express a preference for cooperation, for altruism, compared to selfishness. And let me just give you one example of this. Um, this is just a picture of the Dalai Lama in our lab in 2001. He's been there several times. Um, but let me start with uh, this little video clip.
Okay. Now... Okay, which do you think six-month-old infants prefer? One of the ways we can ask a six-month-old infant which she or he prefers is by looking at their gaze, uh, looking to see where they actually look. Uh, and it turns out, using a variety of indices, gaze is one, but several others, uh, a number of scientists have now marshaled evidence to show that infants prefer the first, the helper, compared to the hinderer. And there are many other examples of this, all pointing toward a kind of innate basic goodness. Now, the reason why this is interesting in the context of meditation and contemplative traditions is that one of the themes in many of the practices that are designed to cultivate compassion and warm-heartedness is that the invitation to practitioners is that these characteristics are, are already within us. And the meditation is really about familiarizing ourselves with qualities that are there from the start. And if we just peel away the gunk, uh, we can begin to see evidence of these qualities in each of us. OK, so um, let me just uh, uh, go over a few of the constituents of well-being that have been described in modern research literature. They include qualities like self-acceptance, positive relations with others, a sense of autonomy, uh, mastery over one's environment, purpose in life, and personal growth. All of these are, are constituents that together have been found to uh, be associated with this construct uh, of well-being. Uh, modern research also indicates that a number of other related qualities, like generosity, seems to be something very important uh, in promoting well-being. Now, one of the ways that we began this work and the, the research that we did that was directly stimulated by my encounter, my first encounter with the Dalai Lama in 1992, was focused on compassion. And the Dalai Lama, uh, the Dalai Lama's message to the world is really uh, centrally focused on compassion. And he was quite interested and encouraged us uh, to begin to do serious scientific research uh, on this construct of compassion. And it's really remarkable if you go back to in, uh, introductory textbooks in psychology, even five years ago, uh, probably very, very few of them have the word compassion in the index, which uh, is really quite astounding. Uh, today, uh, where there's been a flurry, an increase in research in this area, uh, and so things are changing uh, quite rapidly. We began this work by bringing into the laboratory the kind of practitioners that the, that the Dalai Lama was particularly interested in having studied, individuals who spent years training their mind um, uh, and we thought that we would bring in these so-called experts to see if we can see changes in their brain when they engage in practices designed to cultivate compassion because if we didn't see changes in these individuals, uh, it would be unlikely that we'd, we would see them in more novice practitioners. So we flew these people in from Asia, which is where most of them lived, and uh, these are all individuals who uh, have spent many thousands of hours engaged in formal practices. And I'll describe what these practices are in a few minutes in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the average number of lifetime hours of practice in this group that I'm about to show you is 34,000 lifetime hours of practice. You can go do the arithmetic at home. 34,000 is a big number. Um, but I'll also show you evidence in a few minutes that it doesn't take much to show changes in the brain and behavior. So we started in a very simple way where we had practitioners alternate between a neutral state and a meditation state just to see if we can observe a difference in the brain. And uh, in the words of one of the practitioners, this is what folks were doing. This 
person said, what we've tried to do is generate a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. Now, you know how sometimes there are those commercials on television where it says in fine print, don't try this at home? Well, I would encourage you, please do try this at home. Uh, but don't be frustrated if it's difficult to do this without any consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. Um, most of us uh, are just um, flooded with this kind of, uh, these kinds of discursive thoughts, but these long-term practitioners, because of their training, at least by their report, are able to do this even in the crazy environment of our laboratory. Um, so this is one of the practitioners who is meditating with measures of brain electrical signals. This is someone who actually is famous in certain circles. He is the author of two very popular books on meditation, um, The Joy of Living and Joyful Wisdom. This is Mingyur Rinpoche. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, he is um, someone who's had, um, uh, he was among the highest in terms of lifetime hours of practice. Um, so we did the first study, and uh, this is a figure from it. Uh, the first author is Antoine Lutz, who is a scientist in our lab. And uh, these show the, this is a figure of the actual changes in brain electrical activity between a neutral state, which is on the left, and a meditation state on the right. And the amazing thing is you don't need fancy computer extraction signal processing techniques to see that there's a difference. Um, there is a visible difference to the naked eye, which is something that we don't normally see when we do this kind of research. Uh, and this was kind of remarkable. And uh, this was the first hint that there might be a there there. Uh, these are gamma oscillations. They're oscillations uh, that are in the 40 cycle per second range. Uh, they typically are seen in an ordinary brain for very, very short periods of time typically less than one second. They're markers of synaptic plasticity. They also uh, are associated with focused attention and with binding of different elements of a percept together in an integrated whole. That's where you see these gamma oscillations. In long-term practitioners, we saw these oscillations for many, many seconds and actually minutes and in certain cases, hours. And we just published a paper showing in long-term practitioners that during deep sleep, we actually see an infiltration of gamma oscillations during deep sleep in long-term practitioners. We don't know at this point what the significance of this is, but one of the things we're starting now is waking them up when we see these gamma oscillations and asking them, <laughs> what's happening? Um, so stay tuned. So uh, this is the practitioner who was the author of that quote that I showed you earlier, and he's an amazing person. Uh, so let me just say one or two words about him. Uh, his name is Mathieu Ricard. He is French by nationality. He's been a Tibetan Buddhist monk since 1967. He also has a PhD in molecular biology from the Pasteur Institute, where he worked with Francois Jacob, the Nobel laureate. Uh, so he comes with remarkable credentials and an ability to bridge this kind of cross-cultural divide uh, in really remarkable ways. We also, we took this picture after Mathieu had been in the scanner for more than three hours. Most people don't look like this when they come out. <laughs> So what did we see when these practitioners were meditating on compassion? Now, what we did in this experiment is we presented emotional sounds to the meditators as they were meditating. And uh, we presented the, the, the most important conditions where we presented what we call sounds of human suffering. These are negative sounds, sounds like a woman screaming or a baby crying unconsolably. They're nonverbal sounds of human suffering. And what we saw is that when the practitioners were generating this state of love and compassion, it was modulating the activity of a number of different networks in the brain, one of which is shown here, which is um, a, a particular region of the brain called the insula or the anterior insula specifically, which is what is circled 
in this brain slice. Uh, and this is a very interesting part of the brain because it's the only part of the brain that has what we call a viscerotopic map. That is, it's got a map of visceral organs in the body and it is the um, area through which uh, mind-body interaction actually is occurring. Uh, and so it was particularly interesting to us that, that this area was modulated. Now, um, let me talk about um, one other major domain that we have worked in, which is attention. This is one of my all-time favorite quotes in, in, in psychology. This was written in 1890 in William James's two-volume tome, The Principles of Psychology, and he has a whole chapter devoted to attention. And he said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compo sui if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And the italics, by the way, are in the original William James. Uh, and then he said, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. Uh, I think that if William James had more contact with the contemplative traditions of the East, he would have instantaneously seen that if nothing else, these are strategies for educating attention. And attention is so important, it's such an important building block for virtually all other forms of learning. Uh, a study published a few years ago from a group of colleagues, friends of mine at Harvard, that used experience sampling methods. That is, they used smartphones and they um, had thousands of people out in the world and they asked them three questions on their smartphones as they were going about their day. They asked them, where is your mind right now? What are you doing? Um, uh, actually, the first question is, what are you doing right now? Second question is, where is your mind right now? Is it focused on what you're doing or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question was, how happy or unhappy are you? And what they found is that the average American adult spends 47% of his or her waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. 47% of the time. And during that period of time, they report themselves to be considerably less happy than when they are paying attention to what they're doing. That is, being focused on what you're doing is intrinsically pleasurable most of the time. Um, uh, and that's a very important study because uh, it suggests that, you know, we all, we really, if we're really honest with ourselves, we're really all suffering from attention deficit disorders. Uh, but the invitation with this work is that we can actually do something about it. So um, uh, these are response time distributions. This is a technical term. You don't really need to know the details here, but if you take a child with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and you give them a stimulus to which they have to respond, their response times are very variable. And that's illustrated in this histogram, which is circled here, uh, and the long tail on your right it is indicative of var variability in their response times. An age-matched typically developing group is on top, they have a much tighter distribution. And we ask the question, can simple mindfulness meditation, paying attention to your breathing, paying attention to your body, for those of you who are at the meditation that I led before, it's kind of like the first meditation that I led. Um, we asked whether that kind of meditation can actually change this. And the answer is that it can. Uh, and so this is a study that was published um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this, what's circled here is a measure of response time variability, this same metric. Lower numbers are better. They mean less variability. And the practitioners are people that went through three months of meditation training. And this is before they went to training the light bars. And this is a control group, novices who are just learning to meditate. Uh, and the darker bars are after three months of practice. And what you can see is that among the practitioners after three months of practice, there is a reduction in this variability. So, um, and there are all kinds of changes in the brain. Now, I'm going to just skip a few things and, and tell you, make two more points. 
One is it doesn't take three months of training or three years of training or, or 15 years of training. Um, this is a study that we published last year showing that if you take people who've never done any of this stuff before and you give them just two weeks of training and you deliver the training on the internet, just 30 minutes a day for two weeks, a total of seven hours of training, you can actually change behavior in the brain. And this was a study where we examined the impact of a simple form of compassion meditation practice. And let me, I'm going to skip the details here, but let me just tell you what this compassion meditation is. We ask people to, to bring into their minds and hearts a loved one and imagine a time in the loved one's life when they were suffering and cultivate this strong aspiration that they'd be relieved of that suffering. So we start with a loved one. We then move on to themselves. We then move on to a person that we call a stranger, someone who, whose face you recognize. It could be a person who works in the same office building that you work in, or someone who's in the same class, but you don't know much about their life. Bring them into your mind and heart, and just envision a time in their life when they may have been suffering. Then we have them move on to a very important category, a difficult person, someone who pushes your buttons. And one of the um, long-term practitioners that I showed you before, Mingyur Rinpoche, in one of his books said that um, two hours of training on a difficult person is equivalent to two months of training on everything else. <laughs> so it's an especially important category. We then have them move on to all beings, as many beings as you can envision. We have them use phrases that they silently repeat to themselves, a phrase like, may you be free from suffering, may you experience joy and ease. Participants are instructed to notice sensations in their body, especially in their heart, which they often report, and they're instructed to feel the compassion emotionally and not to simply repeat these phrases cognitively. Uh, and this is, was a very carefully controlled study where we randomly assigned people to either this compassion group or to an equivalent group that didn't receive compassion training but received training that's based on cognitive therapy, also designed to promote well-being. And um, uh, we had them go through the training, and then after the training, we did MRI scans before and after the training. And then at the end, they did some economic decision-making tasks that enabled us to get behavioral measures of altruism and their pro-social behavior. I don't have time to go through the details of these measures, but after two weeks of training, the compassion group actually behaves more altruistically, uh, and their brain changes in all kinds of interesting ways that I don't have time to go into, but suffice it to say that after just seven hours of training, the brain changes, and the changes that we see in the brain in networks that are important for empathy and also for the regulation of attention, these networks predict the extent to which people behave pro-socially on these economic decision-making tasks. So I want to just end now by simply saying that we're bringing this work to kids in schools, uh, we've developed a curriculum that we call the Kindness Curriculum. Uh, we're implementing this with preschool children. And um, uh, we're doing studies where we're randomly assigning this curriculum to different classrooms and looking at the impact uh, of this training on kids' behavior and on um, uh, uh, the classroom environment. And uh, we're also, and I'm just going to pardon me just flipping through this to go to the end here. Um, we're also developing video games that are targeted for older children. This is um, work that we're, we're, uh, is very new. This is a project funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, games that are targeted for middle school kids to cultivate mindfulness and kindness. Uh, these are some screenshots from a mindfulness game where they have to keep track of their breathing uh, and tap an iPad with each breath and then tap with two fingers every nth breath, like every fifth breath. And it turns out when you do that, you make mistakes on the fifth breath because your mind wanders. Uh, and so we can use that as a key game mechanic to uh, have kids trained to track 
uh, more and more breath cycles correctly. And as they do, these environments that they're inhabiting begin to populate with beautiful flowers and other stuff. Um, uh, and we've tested these games now on thousands of kids. We've also had expert advice from our monk friends uh, who uh, have gone through these games and given us uh, their comments. Um, and uh, this is our empathy and pro-social game, Crystals of Kador. And uh, this game involves, it's a much more complicated game. It involves landing on an alien planet. You don't speak the alien's language, but the aliens have very human-like facial expressions. And one of your tasks is to recognize their faces and then use that information to infer what they need. And you're rewarded by uh, correctly detecting their nonverbal cues of emotion and then using that information for pro-social purposes to help them uh, and be cooperative uh, uh, and uh, help them accomplish their tasks. So this is one of the faces. These are animated in anatomically realistic ways. Um, so uh, this is where we do our work. Uh, it's a center that I founded at the University of Wisconsin. If you're interested in learning more, and if you're interested in the compassion meditation, which I talked just briefly about before, uh, you can download the um, compassion training free from our website, uh, and that's investigatinghealthyminds.org. Uh, so please feel free to do that. And I want to end with uh, another quote. Uh, which is something that Albert Einstein wrote to a friend of his who was having a lot of difficulty with his daughter uh, who uh, was in a crisis. And Einstein said in, in 1921, a human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have the honor and pleasure of inviting Betsy back up so we can uh, have a conversation together. So I think we have to use these mics now. Uh, everyone can hear us? Good. So uh, I thought I'd start off by just first saying uh, uh, how much I really um, love your stuff and really respect what you're doing. And just ask, um, you: the work that you're doing seems to require that you identify these, um, I forget exactly the terms you use, the click leaders or the... Widely known. Widely known. And the social reference. Right. Um, so... Uh, uh, and and it's, it would seem that the effectiveness of the interventions that you're doing to some extent depend upon the extent to which these um, select people uh, really embody in some way the intervention that you're delivering. And uh, I wonder if you see this as a potential place where... Um, where the, the level at which you're working and the individual level potentially can come together to produce uh, a synergistic effect that may be even more powerful. Yeah, I was thinking to myself during this presentation, where were your, where were your video games uh, when we were doing this? That would have been really amazing. Um, yeah, I think that um, in our work, when we're trying to affect a uh, um, behavior on a collective level. Yes, you have to start with the individual, and um, and it's interesting um, to try to motivate people to become, you know, the the face of of a different kind of of behavior, um, particularly when that's just not their normal practice. That's not how they've been gaining status or maintaining their reputation for a while. Um, and so, uh, so I was thinking about this actually because. Um, 
I was also interested in, you know, what kind of motivation you need to bring to meditation um, in order for it to be as effective. Because I was wondering, uh, I was thinking personally, well, how would we have motivated some of these students um, uh, maybe to um, be more compassionate and more kind, maybe through meditation? And um, I can say one of the ways that we tried to interest students in participating in our program was actually just to tell them the kind of influence we thought they had over their schools. Um, this made them feel really good. Um, and I think that that was a big part of the motivation for joining. And um, But I, I think I'll take away from tonight, and as many, so many will, um, this message about the importance of meditation. And I was wondering, should I be telling others it will change your brain, it will um, increase your attention, uh, or should I tell them it will make you more altruistic, it will make you more compassionate? And I don't know what would convince, maybe you can tell me more about that too, what would convince a middle schooler uh, to meditate? Um, but, uh, but even, I mean, I think that both of us are thinking about these as lessons, not just for schools, but for workplaces and communities more generally. So, um, yeah, if, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, so those are wonderful reflections. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, in terms of what to tell people uh, what meditation does, I mean, in some sense... It, it does, that you can find evidence that it does all of those things, although there's so much hype uh, that's associated with meditation these days, and I think that it's better to err on the side of being really cautious and uh, uh, just inviting them to say that some people have found it beneficial, but investigate for yourself uh, and see whether it's helpful. Uh, in terms of the kids, one of the things that the kids, particularly young kids that we've worked with in schools, enjoy the most is just having a quiet timeout period where they can sort of go offline and um, uh, and collect themselves, uh, and uh, 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 and that that it's safe and it's okay to do that, uh, uh, and. In many of the classrooms, they've created like a little space where kids can go, a physical space. Uh, if they are upset uh, and they can go and spend a few minutes there and uh, just uh, uh, in the very young kids, we do uh, very simple practices. One of them is belly breathing where they lie on the floor and we put a little stone on their belly and they just watch the stone go up and down. Uh, and it's amazing how pleasurable kids find this and that they, they gravitate toward it. And uh, when we have been teaching the kindness curriculum, we go in for um, three periods a week, three 30-minute periods, and the kids always ask us, why can't they get it every day? Uh, they really want it every day. It's something that they, that they really love to do. Um, so... Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I think it changes, clearly it changes once the kids are older. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we went to games, which is uh, a place where we can potentially reach them more effectively. One thing that, um, that we think about a lot in, in our research is um, how do you show that kindness or compassion is spreading? And so we have all of these you know, measures of whether people are, you know, getting in trouble for, for conflict, um, their self-reports of how they're doing. And I know that that's one of the things that makes kindness and compassion research so difficult, um, is we have tools to measure anxiety and depression. And um, I guess there are many ways to measure compassion, but I was wondering, in, in those studies that you're doing now, um, but in other studies that you've done in the past, do you have favorite measures or, or indicators when compassion is growing or kindness? Yeah, well, this is something that as scientists, you know, people like Betsy and I just um, stay up at night um, thinking about these kinds of things. It's uh, not everyone's ordinary concerns, but uh, uh, it, it is something we've struggled a lot with, and it's not easy. Um, there, there are some uh, interesting approaches that people have used. They have adopted strategies from your discipline, your original discipline, social psychology. So one of the phenomena that social psychologists have studied is um, a phenomena that's been known in that literature. Uh, it's called bystander intervention. Uh, and so uh, in one experiment that was very recently published, people were trained in, in compassion 
meditation. And then they went into another room and uh, uh, there was a bench that was, there were three Confederates sitting on the bench uh, and then um, uh, including the the subject in question. And then a woman walked in on crutches um, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is not quite bystander intervention, but it's looking at whether the subject is more likely to get up and how long it took them to get up to offer their seat to the person who is on crutches. Uh, uh, and so that kind of measure has been used. Um, uh, economic decision-making tasks were uh, of the sort that I very briefly mentioned uh, have been used uh, in... In young kids, it, we, it's actually easier. So we developed a task actually inspired by uh, some of the work in um, behavioral economics, uh, but that is actually, I think, more ecologically valid with kids. What we did with kids is we gave them, uh, these are preschool and kindergarten kids, we gave them a currency that is important to them. And a currency that's really important to preschool kids is stickers. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we gave them a bunch of stickers, and we, uh, through sociometric ratings, we find out who the kid's best friend is in the class, who the kid's least favorite person is, uh, and we have pictures of each of these kids. And so we have an envelope where we put the picture of their best friend, another envelope where we have the picture of their least favorite person, a third envelope where we have a picture of a stranger child, a child they've never seen before, and a fourth envelope we have a picture of an obviously sick-looking child. Uh, and then we do trials where we have one envelope which is labeled me, which has their own picture, and then a second envelope which is one of those other categories. And we say, here are a bunch of stickers, divide them according to how you'd like them to be distributed. And we actually distribute them in that way. And um, it turns out that over the course of kindergarten and first grade, um, at least in the schools that we've been working with, these are public schools in Madison, Wisconsin, um, kids on average get progressively more and more selfish uh, as the school year goes on. And what we find is that the kids who go through the kindness curriculum um, uh, sh do not show any evidence of getting more selfish, and there's some evidence for some of the categories where they actually become more altruistic. It seems like it's always um, easy to justify doing this kind of work in schools. Everyone has a clear idea that um, we should be increasing kindness there. And I think I've heard you mention that um, you've tried doing this in some workplaces as well. And I, I think it relates to this question about how do you measure the, the gains to to meditation or, or to any other kind of intervention because you have to justify some sort of bottom line for businesses, for workplaces when you, when you do this kind of work. Um, so have you had to do that? Have you had to justify why um, adults should be doing this in the workplace? Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. It relates to your earlier question too about how to describe the effects of meditation. And, um, and it's also something that I've briefly chatted with the Harvard Pilgrim friends who are here uh, in the reception that we had just before this, uh, there is a smidgen of evidence, and I, I certainly underscore the smidgen, and I, uh, uh, it's just a... Is that a scientific term? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Very significant scientific term. Um, so that, that engaging in these practices may decrease healthcare utilization. And through that, decrease healthcare costs because people actually, these are practices that can promote wellness. Um, uh, I think that this is one of the most important domains that really needs to be rigorously, empirically evaluated. And this is one of the reasons why we're doing this big initiative in the workplace. We're doing an initiative where we can um, have these interventions that are largely delivered digitally uh, and we can scale them massively and collect data on tens of thousands of individuals and actually track their healthcare utilization. And um, uh, we also will track prescription drug costs. Uh, I was given information, that, again, in the in Madison Public School District uh, in 2011, uh, spent about $1.9 million on the single category of antidepressant medication for their staff. We can do better. I'm absolutely convinced that we can do better. 
Uh, and it doesn't need to be that. And I think that if we can show that it actually decreases those kinds of costs, then then it will. It's going to be like gay marriage. Um, the whole culture is going to change just like that. Um, so of course, then I also I'm wondering too as I'm as I'm watching your talk. Um, how might this spread? I'm not sure how much you've thought about this in, in your own research group, but from our perspective, we're always wondering, if you change someone's mental process, if you change someone's behavior, um, what is the effect on, on the collective? Do these kinds of changes, um, are they infectious? Are they contagious? Um, or um, is it more of a social learning process where, um, I mean, did you have a contagious effect when you started meditating? You said in the beginning it was, you know, you didn't even admit to anyone that, that you were meditating. But um, do we have any idea that this might help our families, help, you know, others in our environment or yeah, in our classroom? Yeah, and those are wonderful questions. And one of the things I learned from you, Betsy, is that we could be more strategic about who we're actually delivering these interventions to and potentially have more impact by being more strategic. And I think that that's a, a wonderful possibility. And... Um, one of the things I hope will come out of this is that we'll collaborate, uh, which would be great. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, so, you know, those are all wonderful questions. I, the, uh, I think that there is an element of, um, of contagion, and I think that probably one of the best ways of measuring compassion is by being around people who just radiate with it. And one of the... Um, one of the things that has been a real honor and privilege for me over the last 20 years is being able to spend a lot of time with the Dalai Lama. So these days I meet with him four or five times a year and I see him in a lot of different contexts. And anyone who's been up close with him, most people feel something. Um, and and it is it is because I think he is just, his compassion is so out there and and so apparent and it's so touching and you can just it, you it affects the people around him um he just gave a talk uh at the nih and i've been trying to arrange this for the last 10 years and finally it happened uh a major address on, on the campus of the national institutes of health and francis collins who's the director of nih asked me what labs he thought would be interesting for the Dalai Lama to see because there was a little bit of time in the beginning um, to show him around. And I said, you know, I, Francis, I really don't think, he's seen a bunch of labs and he's seen MRI scanners and, you know, he knows what science labs look like. I think what you should do, th there's, a, there's a hospital on the NIH campus where people with rare disorders are actually treated and where the fruits of science are really brought to the bedside. I said, have him go through the hospital and actually meet patients. Um, this is where you'll really see him shine. And, and they did that. Uh, and I was with him as we walked through the clinical center on the NIH campus. And it, there were tears rolling down so many people's faces because each person, each patient the Dalai Lama saw, he held them. And some of these people probably didn't know who he was. Uh, some of them did, but it didn't matter. Uh, and and through what he did, he he I think imparted something special, and and I think something that had clear physiological consequences. Uh, and so I think that um, that's a case of um, uh, uh, of you know identifying strategically a person who really can have these profound network effects. Um. I can't help but ask, uh, so what does the Dalai Lama think of all of this research? And uh, is he interested in, in the brain changes? And you know, what, what do you think is part of the, the interest driving the, the kind of collaboration, the scientific collaboration here? Uh, well, I think that he, he's really deeply curious about science. He has said that he has two commitments for the remainder of his life. One is to work on behalf of the Tibetan people and the other is to meet with scientists. Um, I wish other religious leaders had similar commitments. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, you know, I think that what he gets out of it is, um, 
I mean, he, he wrote a book on science and spirituality called The Universe in a Single Atom. And in the very first chapter of that book, he says something amazing. He said, if there's any tenant in Buddhism which is directly contradicted by scientific fact, he's prepared to give it up. Uh, and, um, uh, and so he's just deeply interested. He really feels that science is a, um, an extremely important vehicle for understanding the, the, the fundamental nature of reality. Uh, and, and that's, in many ways, what I think he would say Buddhism is about. Uh, and so he sees a very deep convergence in terms of their goals. And I guess in terms of convergence between goals, um, you should stop us, by the way, when we're supposed to open up, because I could keep going for a really long time. <laughs> uh, one thing I really liked about what you said um, in in scientific presentations, it's not n typical to say, um, here's something that I do in my own personal life, and here's how that aspect of my personal life influenced my science. But you know, you told us about how you had um, uh, been interested in meditation and, and where where you were influenced to, to start to study this. And, um, and I, I would love to hear your story, because that was a question that I wanted to ask you. Oh, that's so. interesting, yeah. <laughs> Is it, um, well, if I, I can start with me then, and then I'd like to hear more about the, the reactions that you got when you started um, studying this and, and the extent to which you were, you felt like you could talk about how it um, was something that you did in your personal life, because we do have this, uh, unlike the Dalai Lama, we are taught to build this, you know, really uh, tall wall or draw a really bright line between um, ourselves as people and ourselves as scientists, which I think is interesting. Um, for me, I, I got very interested in this work um, in part because um, I had been studying popular media and even soap operas in a lot of post-conflict countries. And I was interested in how media changed people's ideas about what's normal and what's typical. Um, and in that case, it was fictional characters um, communicating these types of behaviors to them. So I was, was very interested in this kind of social perception. Um, and, uh, and then I thought, well, you know, it's obviously also people who are right in front of you who are giving you these um, ideas as well. And, uh, and on a personal level, you know, both my parents have worked in schools their whole lives, so I, I felt very comfortable in that environment. And uh, it was one that made a lot of sense to me. I knew immediately when I walked into schools, I knew how to talk to teachers or commiserate with them about what was going on at the moment. And uh, so I, I love doing the work that I do because I love interacting with the people I get to interact with. Um, I think it's a real privilege to be able to leave the laboratory and, uh, um, and learn from people. And you know, you, that's how you get your best ideas, I think. So. That's wonderful. Well, maybe we should open that up for questions. Folks, can I see a show of hands who has questions? Awesome. First question right here. Dr. Davidson, you mentioned um, these gamma oscillations in the brain during meditation. And I was just wondering, because earlier you mentioned how there were relevant uh, systematic expression in genes as well uh, after meditation. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that expression in genes. Uh, yeah, so the, the work on gene expression changes is quite new, but we there was this paper that we did publish this past year, um, and there have been a couple of other attempts that are similar. One of the things that's important uh, in the work on gene expression is that genes uh, uh, are expressed differently in different parts of the body and different parts of the brain, and so we were measuring gene expression in in blood, in peripheral blood lymphocytes. And we wanted to choose a set of genes that made sense uh, to be regulated in, the, in that compartment of the body, so to speak. Uh, and so we focused on genes that were implicated in inflammation. The reason we, uh, second reason we, we wanted to focus on genes implicated in inflammation is because there were there was other kinds of evidence to suggest that certain types of meditation practices may help reduce inflammation. Um, and since inflammation is so critically part of many chronic diseases, this was another reason. And, uh, uh, and so what we found is evidence for the downregulation of a number of very critical genes that have been implicated in a whole uh, inflammatory cascade. 
Uh, and we did that by simply taking blood samples uh, when people came into the laboratory in the morning, and then we have a meditation space in our lab, and they sat in the lab uh, uh, and did eight hours of practice, alternating between sitting and walking practice. We had a control group come into the laboratory for a day of leisure, uh, where they were sedentary for the day, they were fed the same diet, and uh, we didn't see any of these kinds of changes in the controls. So um, that's how we did the study and, and basically what the findings were. Sure. Next question is right over here. So hello, um, uh, hello uh, uh, everyone. Uh, so I have uh, two questions. Um, so you said uh, how uh, you know doing meditation changes the mind, uh, changes the brain um, to some extent. So my question is. Um, how long or how frequently do you have to do it? Because what I observed is you use, uh, I personally do it for like two uh, uh, like two months and then later I, I forget about it or I do not do it. And then I come back to square one. So that is uh, that was my first question. And second question was uh, through meditation, uh, do you have techniques where you, um, uh, where you help people uh, stop um, you know, wanting things that um, that that or clinging on to things um, that they shouldn't be clinging on to. <laughs> yeah. So so let me take them in turn. With respect to the first question, um, it's kind of like physical exercise. If you went to a trainer and did two weeks of or two months of physical exercise and really got buffed up, uh, and then stopped doing exercise, no one would think that the effects are going to persist. Uh, and so I don't think that there's any magic bullet here. I think that if these um, practices are going to produce enduring effects, we're talking about lifelong practices. It's like brushing your teeth. Um, it's something that, that is really the invitation is to do it every day. Uh, but it's also the case that the distinction between formal periods of practice and everyday life becomes intentionally blurred so that you can practice as you're walking to work or driving. Uh, there, there are just countless opportunities to practice. Uh, it's really the, 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 it's all about bringing awareness to what we're doing. The essence of, of all forms of meditation is awareness. Um, and so remembering to bring awareness to what we're doing is, is really the critical piece. Uh, and, and doing that on a regular basis is something that we think can produce enduring effects. Um, so, and the second question was, remind me again. Stop. Uh, oh yeah, and stop, yeah. Uh, well, I think that, um, you know, the, the scientific term for this is stickiness. Um, <laughs> uh, it's kind of uh, an inability to let go of stuff, uh, clinging to it, uh, and, um, uh, this is something that changes over time. It, and I think it's important to be patient. Um, but we did a study with pain that is a good example of this. If you give a person a cue, just a simple tone, and you say, when you hear this tone, it means in 10 seconds you're going to get zapped with a really painful stimulus. Um, uh, and... Uh, and then the pain occurs, and then there's a recovery period. It turns out that if you bring an ordinary person into the laboratory and you give them an experience of the pain, which is heat, and it's very realistic, it's a burning sensation, but it's very safe. Um, it, when you present that cue, all the networks in the brain and in the body that are associated with pain get activated immediately. Uh, even though there's no physical pain, the, just the tone is enough. It's it's a kind of conditioning. Uh, in the in long-term meditation practitioners, when that cue comes on, nothing happens. Uh, then when the pain occurs, there's a big response. But then in the recovery period, they recover right away. They come right back down to baseline. Whereas in the novices, they have this clinging and stickiness that you're talking about. They don't let go of it. Uh, even though it's not serving any useful function at that point. Uh, and so uh, that's something that is trainable. That can be changed. Uh, we, we've published hard-nosed scientific evidence showing that, uh, and I think it's a learnable skill. 
uh, but it does require practice. So thank you for the questions. Next question here. Thank you. I wonder what you guys look like at home. <laughs> do, you, do you have grouchy moments, and what do you look like in it? Thank you. We have what? A few grouchy moments, and what do you look doubting, like in there? Doubting moments. Grouchy. Grouchy moments. Oh, grouchy moments. And do you have you know, data and actually, that? this relates to a question Betsy asked me that I never answered, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, sometimes beginning graduate students or, or um, researchers in certain places are just doing questionnaire studies. They don't have funds to do anything more elaborate. And I've frequently consulted to give them advice about it. And I say, if, you, if you're just giving out questionnaires, don't give it to the person, her or himself. Give it to their spouse. Um, you'll learn a lot more about the tr their, their true nature, not by asking them, but asking their spouse. So ask their spouse if they've gotten kinder or more mindful. Uh, so um, uh, my spouse is in here now, but uh, uh, so I'm a little protected from... But, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, I would say that in my own personal life, just answering your question honestly, um, there was a period in my life um, 15 years ago about when I was much more volatile at work. Uh, and um, my, uh, I, I was definitely had a lower threshold for frustration. Uh, now, some of that may just be n normal aging. Uh, and I don't discount that, but you know, I think some of it may be uh, my own practice. I certainly believe that uh, my practice has contributed to uh, my overall emotional balance, what little of it I have. Um. <laughs> okay, next question over here. Oh, it for me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, um, Tonight, I, I don't know, I probably share this with a lot of people here, that tonight's inspired me to try to take up meditation again. I've tried at different periods of my life. Um, but one thing that I've learned to do, uh, if not meditation, and it's something that I learned from a colleague who uh, we share in common, uh, Eldar Shafir, which is um, to basically take timeouts like the kids in those classrooms um, and not schedule my day with meetings starting as other ones end, but to, as he said, puts it, uh, build a little slack into my schedule always and to never allow anyone to schedule anything in that 15 minutes between a meeting um, and, uh, I, and to just really schedule the meeting with myself. I mean, I put it in my planner. It's a meeting with Betsy. Um, <laughs> And uh, I can do whatever I want, but you know, it, it, I think that really helps me to be less, less grouchy. Yeah. Okay, over here. Thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Davidson. Um, are you or do you plan to study the effects of compassion training and or meditation on recovering addicts, violent convicts, or individuals suffering from mental disorders such as major depressive disorder? Yeah, so thank you for asking that question. All incredibly uh, significant problems that, that need all kinds of uh, attention and, and solutions. Um, we've done a little bit of work in some of those areas. Uh, uh, not a lot. Uh, there is some work going on uh, in each of those areas. Uh, the most well-developed is in the realm of depression. Uh, there is a, uh, a kind of therapeutic technique called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is a melding of traditional cognitive therapy with mindfulness meditation. It was developed by uh, Zindel Siegel uh, in Toronto and Mark Williams uh, uh, in, at Oxford, and also John Kabat-Zinn has participated, who is a local uh, and a very dear friend. Um, uh, and there have been really good scientific studies now evaluating the impact of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in, in depression. And where it makes the biggest difference is in minimizing depressive relapse. So among people who have a diagnosis of major depression, if they're given mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, particularly during a period where their symptoms have remitted, um, the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy is very helpful in uh, decreasing relapse. Uh, in terms of addiction, 
We just had a meeting this past fall in Dharamsala, India with the Dalai Lama on the theme of craving, desire, and addiction. And we actually had with us the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, Nora Volkow, one of the NIH institutes, um, uh, which was amazing to have her there. It was one of the, it was the first time that an NIH institute director has participated in a meeting with the Dalai Lama at his residence in India, which was a very significant first. Um, uh, and, you know, she participated because she feels that the time is ripe to really start studying this. These are methods that are in many ways ideally suited to diminish craving. Uh, because craving in, the, in these traditions is the root of suffering. And these techniques are designed to directly tackle craving. Uh, and so I think that this is going to be an area of tremendous opportunity. There is a group at the University of Washington in Seattle uh, that's probably the furthest along, and they've developed a mindfulness-based um, uh, um, abstinence treatment uh, for addiction. And uh, they've been doing some research on this, and there have been some good successes. In terms of the prison population, uh, there's a number of demonstration projects that have occurred, uh, and uh, there have been, there's a wonderful documentary film called The Dhamma Brothers that was made by a woman named Jenny Phillips, who's uh, an anthropologist. And it was a film, uh, a documentary made about a maximum security prison in Alabama, where they actually taught meditation in the prison. And it's very, very moving. It's, there are no scientific data of which I'm aware, however. Um, but there, there's work that's, that I know is starting up. So I think over the next few years, we'll start to see some real evidence in this area. So thank you. Next question here. So thank you, both of you, very much. And um, also, thanks to Harvard Pilgrim, your friends at Harvard Pilgrim, for the reason that we're here. Um, but. I'm wondering what kind of definitions you're thinking about with meditation and how that overlaps with prayer. Uh, well, I'm frequently asked this question, uh, uh, and I th certainly think that there is likely to be some overlap. There hasn't been any much serious scientific research on prayer. There's been a little, but not a lot. Um, and this was a question that actually was asked of me in the meditation session that we had earlier. Uh, and, you know, I think that there are likely going to be some similarities. There may be some differences as well. Uh, I think that if prayer is done with regularity uh, for in consistency uh, and, and uh, a kind of genuine motivation, not, not doing it as a sense of, out of a sense of duty, but... Um, really having a, a more um, uh, um, uh, pro-social kind of motivation uh, I, that may be quite similar, but I, I, we don't know at this point in time. One of the other things that's important to point out, though, is that there are many different forms of meditation that do different things to the brain and body, and I assume that there are also different kinds of prayer. Next question right here. Thank you very much. So I'm wondering, besides where are uh, you? Raise your hand. Here. Oh, great. Okay. Besides practice, uh, have you ever found any medicine or chemical or food is able to help us with uh, increase of the gamma alteration, uh, increase of frequency and the length? Because uh, as we all know, uh, most of Buddhists, Buddhists they are vegetarian. So uh, is that helpful if we eat more selectively? Yeah, it's a wonderful question, and uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, in terms of food, uh, certainly I have the personal conviction that uh, how we eat definitely affects our brain and our mind, uh, and uh, there's a, a smidgen of research that I know of on that. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of medication, you know, the Dalai Lama jokes about this all the time. He said, you know, if there's... If there's a part of my brain where we know that uh, if you stimulated that, uh, it would increase my levels of compassion, he would 
say he would give permission to neurosurgeons to go in and stimulate. Um, but of course, that's all real science fiction. And also, it's a very, uh, I think, inappropriate and excessively simple-minded way of thinking about the brain. My own view is that qualities like compassion are so complicated and involve so many different brain networks and so many different chemicals in the brain that to think that we can create a medication which would increase it is really naive. Uh, and I just don't uh, think it's going to happen. Uh, and uh, I think you're much better off spending a few minutes every day uh, doing these practices. Next question here. Thank you. Hi, this is for Betsy. I was really um, drawn to your diagrams in, in terms of the social networking and, and especially to those children on the peripheries who had very little connection and wondered if there would be like a phase two where you look at those children to see if, if there's a way to make them less at risk in terms of the issues related to compassion. Yeah, I think that's... Um that would be a fantastic second stage. Um, social network maps are so interesting to look at, but as you point out, sometimes really painful looking um, when you see those dots out at the outer edges. Um, in fact, the, the, the sort of mathematical and scientific fact of social network graphs is that you can graph them in many different ways, and sometimes people are at the periphery, and sometimes they're in the center. You can move them around, but the fact remains that you can always see the people who, um, you notice probably that the lines were actually arrows, and when you have an arrow pointing at you, it means someone has nominated you. Um, and sometimes you see people who have arrows going out, but no arrows coming in. And that's particularly painful to see when you look at these, these social interaction maps. Um, that was one thing, actually, even that schools asked us, you know, could you tell us who isn't receiving as many nominations? Because we'd like to be able to reach out for them to them. Um, one thing I can tell you is that in the interventions that we did, um, we noticed that on average people were gaining connections um, over the course of the year, those who started out with fewer. And so um, I think that one, one way to think about increasing compassion is actually in increasing integration um, in the schools and, and in um, increasing those connections among them. But I, th I think that would be a really interesting second step as well. Okay, next question's over here. Hi, uh, a question about novices and meditation. You noted um, that it's sort of it only takes about two weeks, or perhaps for for the newer um, folks that meditate. And do you think is it the persistence, or is it because they're getting better at meditation? I think sometimes you're sitting there and you're like you have you have other thoughts and you're not sure if things are happening. So is that still meditating? I mean, is it just if you keep doing that for two weeks, eventually? <laughs> you'll get the benefits, or, or what do you think is happening? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, you know, when uh, uh, all of us uh, are subject to mind wandering, and I asked uh, in the earlier meditation, how many people, I can ask it here, how many people have ever had the experience of reading a book where you're actually reading the pages, and you've turned the pages, and then you go one page or another page, and you have no friggin' idea what you've just read? <laughs> well... Um, so, you know, the, the moment, though, when you notice that, that's a moment of awakening. That's a moment that can be harnessed, and those are the precious moments. So when someone says that they, quote, can't meditate, you know, that, that just doesn't make any sense, because if your mind is wandering and then you notice that it's wandering, that's actually good. Um, it's, those are moments that you're waking up, and so... Uh, we don't really know. Uh, I mean, what we showed in our study that I mentioned is that we see evidence of differences after just two weeks of training. Um, uh, on average, in a group of participants, uh, some people would likely show those effects earlier than two weeks. Other people don't show the effects at two weeks. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of variation. Um, uh, and so we don't know what the magic number is. Uh, and also, you know, I, I have the conviction that one size is not going to fit all. Uh, and one of the efforts in our research these days is to uh, try to match a person's emotional and cognitive style with specific practices that may be 
most effective for that person to um, promote well-being. So thank you. Next question here. Thank you. Uh, this is for Betsy, and it has to do with, uh, with, there's a lot of curricula around bullying in schools now, and a lot of it has to do with being an interested and active bystander and standing up. So you pointed out that students actually like the quiet uh, bystander as opposed to the active one. Is anything in your work um, giving you any more information about that or going to help going forward in the curricula we're now using in our schools? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And actually, I'll point out that um, the um, the statement that was just released, the report, or I guess it, it could be called by the White House on sexual assault on campuses also emphasized active bystander programs. So this is something that's not just in the anti-bullying curriculum. So it's a really important idea. We should really know what's going on with it. Um, I think that one reason why um, students in previous studies have not have disliked active bystanders is that it usually means, and these curricula usually report um, or, or usually recommend going to the teacher, going to an adult to report on someone else. And so, you know, no one likes a, a snitch, right? Um, and that's, uh, I think, one of the really unidimensional ways in which bystanders are, um, are presented. And I think that's gotten a lot more diversified in a lot of curricula since then. Um, so there are a lot of different suggestions for how to be an active bystander, you know, say something directly to the, the person who's, who's targeting, um, say something later to the target to try to comfort them. That's another way to be an active bystander. And I think as the culture of the, the group and of the school shifts, those bystanders would be seen in a more positive light. So it, in part, it's just a function of where the, the community is at in terms of their, their attitude toward, um, toward bullying or, or conflict and, and the social norms of what's acceptable. So I think that active bystandership can become more normative and more acceptable as time goes on, but it's really hard in the first stages. And I think the thing that I worry about with curricula that are solely focused on active bystandership is that it puts all of the onus on students to, to do that work. And if they are socially punished for it, then we're at an impasse. Um, so if you're starting from a place where bystanders will be punished why would we? Why would we ask our students to do this? Um, it's it's really hard for them. So, thinking about multiple supports, thinking about giving them other ways to be a positive friend or a bystander, or just to exemplify that behavior themselves, um, are, are other good ideas. I think. Next questions over here. Hi, this is for Dr. Davidson. Um, so. Uh, I have a question in regards to multi my nephew. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Simon. I didn't, I didn't want to call you out or embarrass you, but yes. <laughs> so, my, you did a great job. You, you as well, Betsy. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, Uncle Richie. Um, <laughs> in, in, in regards to meditation, um, I find that in, in the workplace for myself that I'm uh, called upon to multitask. And can meditation help someone who has to multitask, or is that sort of swimming upstream? You can't have both. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. And, um, you know, I think that the, 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 there, there is uh, uh, interesting research in the um, behavioral sciences uh, on this topic. And one... There's one view which holds that there really isn't such a thing as multitasking. That what we're what we are what we say is multitasking is when we're rapidly switching among different tasks. But uh, if you look at a fine, uh, finely grained temporal scale, we're actually just doing one thing at a time, but we're doing lots of things sequentially, and so we're constantly shifting our attention and. Um, one of the uh, one of the costs that we typically associate with multitasking is there. There's a cost exacted um, because we have difficulty switching our attention in those kinds of ways. Uh, it's precisely the kind of reason why um, Betsy's prescription from her colleague makes a lot of sense to build in a buffer between meetings uh, to uh, enable uh, uh, resources to be. Uh, to be collected to to then address the next set of challenges that come down the pike. 
um, uh, to help with the switching. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that certain kinds of meditation may actually facilitate the switching uh, and enable you to engage in switching with less penalty. Uh, that work, you know, there, there, there are few studies that have been published along those lines, but we, we still need a lot more evidence for that. Um, so it's, it's a very important issue. And, uh, you know, I think the, we really don't fully understand this yet. And certainly I think that the rate at which information is coming in is probably just exhausting the system, even with a skilled multitasker. Although I do have this wonderful picture of Mathieu Ricard, uh, that was taken in my house where he has a laptop open. He's talking on a cell phone. Uh, he has some other digital device, camera that he's playing with. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of labeled the multitasking monk. Um, so, but he's able to do it pretty effectively. And this will be the last question. Uh, thank you very much, and I really enjoy uh, both of your presentation. And I just have, you know, two quick comments, you know. Um, the first one is that um, I believe in everything, you know, as, you, as long as you can show me the evidence-based science. So I'm really delighted, you know, um, you know, Dr. Anderson, you saw some of the functional MRI and some other studies, and also Bessie, you know, the uh, social network science, probably more even, you know, elaborated by our Harvard professor, you know, Christicus. You know, on that along the same domain, also the MIT, the uh, Median Lab, you know, the uh, Sandy. My uh, number one quick comment is that, you know, I realize and my clinical impression is that the meditation are equally or as good as, you know, to other, you know, counseling or, uh, you know, health process, you know, improvement technique, including relaxation exercise at bed. Uh, you know, uh, hospital here. And also uh, the Buddhas, you know, they have the uh, recitation, repetition of a simple, you know, word and also, you know, uh, in uh, Catholic church, a Protestant church and uh, Buddhist, you know, the prayer. And they are e equally efficacious. Maybe some are more slightly you know, uh, potent than the others. Just like you asked me to compare how you treat the depressed patient. You know, either you give antidepressant, you do psychotherapy, you do uh, e electroconvulsive therapy, you do the electromagnetic stimulation. They all, you know, effective. But some are more effective than others. For instance, like electroconvulsive shock is more stronger and potent than the electromagnetic. You know, it's already published. My last. Quick comment is that uh, we lost our compassion gene, you know, over the process of devolution due to the complexity of the social socialization process. How do I prove it to you? If you look into, uh, you mentioned Francis Colin. Okay, uh, last thirty second. Um, Francis Colin, you know, they they find a gene in the uh, you know Hutchinson, Guilford, Pogerio patient. They all happy. They are genetically happy, but they are, you know, a disease. And also, they also find another syndrome. They lost 27 genes, and the uh, patient uh, become more altruistic and more happy and compassionate. So we lost our compassion genes. That's my comment. We can't end on that. <laughs> Well, we can take one more question. <laughs> Thank you for those observations. All right. Here you go. Last question here. Um, I know you've done the work, Betsy, I know you've done work in um, schools. Um, this past Saturday went to a meeting of mothers who'd lost their sons to urban homicides. So I'm wondering... <clears throat> What can we take from your work and apply to urban homicides? Because this is, you know, this is much more, you know, it's just a huge problem. So, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, there is uh, 
an epidemiologist uh, by the name of Gary Slutkin, um, who I've connected with actually in Cambridge in the past at um, conferences. And um, his idea is that we should treat violence in our communities as we do diseases, um, and that they can actually follow the same kind of infectious path as a disease. And um, he started a um, organization, uh, they're called the Cure Violence Network, and they started in Chicago, um, where uh, very similar in spirit to the kind of work that we're doing in schools, they've been recruiting um, ex-prisoners um, who have been part of gangs in the past um, to work with them and try to go to the epicenter of violent events. So literally, as they become aware of something brewing in the neighborhood, um, there was a documentary about this, which I really recommend. It's great. It's called The Interrupters. Um, they send one of these, you know, let's call them the interrupter, um, to the scene uh, to try to talk people down. Um, and the idea is that, you know, once, if they allow that violent event to occur, it will start to spread out. And so this is, you know, as an epidemiologist working in other parts of the world, that's how he was trying to stop the spread of disease. So um, I think there are other people doing this kind of really fantastic work looking at networks and, and how things spread. So, yeah, thanks for that question. I think we have all had many revelations tonight. Oh my God, that was just amazing. I mean, well-being. I mean, we can all go home knowing well-being is a skill we can cultivate and it improves your general health. That's a mind blower. Mindfulness enhances well-being. So, and being aware of our minds wandering is a step in the right direction. That's a <laughs> mind blower. Um, and video games that train pro-social behavior are coming to a store near you. <laughs> I mean, that's hopeful. Um, and the idea of these two working together is, is beyond exciting, so we all look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you.